woke up today looking like Charles Manson meets Jesus meets a man living in his cave because we are still in the middle of the quarantine. <sighs> Hopefully everyone's doing all right. Uh, special Sunday edition. It's uh, quite, quite interesting these days. Everything that's going on in the world, the police brutality protests have effectively gone global. You can see massive gatherings of people, anywhere from a few hundred to tens of thousands strong in different countries worldwide, protesting the unnecessary use of force by police officers. I don't know what to say about it. It's hard to really wrap your mind around what's going on. I think it's incredible to see so many people coming together. It's incredible to see something that is happening and occurring in all 50 states, which is something that I don't remember seeing post 9-11. And as horrific as that time in our history was, to see that 50 states come together so strong, everyone with their flags out, everyone in a state of hyper-patriotism, standing arm in arm with their neighbors up oh, we have the entrance of my good friend michael alperes he's grown out his hair it's incredible what up dude you're growing out hair bro i know it's crazy right so are you though well, i mean it's not like i haven't seen that before but... <laughs> dude I, <laughs> I was just saying before you hopped on that i look like some fucking jesus Charles Manson hybrid right now, dude. I just need a little fucking little swastika in the middle of my fucking forehead, and I will straight up be. But I can't because I got the Bob Ross on. How can you be anything like Manson when you're creating birds out of mistakes? Maybe, maybe Manson. If Manson and like Jesus were sexy studs, then maybe. But dude. look at me. I'm I'm trying to get the Bob Ross going on here. If I dude, keep it up, I'll you, get there. You got to, dude. I've always <laughs> been so jealous of my cousins because they have super curly hair. <laughs> Ever since I was a kid, I was like, when I get older, I'm gonna fucking Jerry curl this shit. I'm gonna look like I'm gonna look like some 1970s funk singer just on stage blasting. <laughs> yeah. I can't play. <laughs> curly hair, man. It's the curly hair. That's fucking hilarious, dude. What is up, yeah. man? Not much, man. Uh, I was just commenting before you hopped on about the fucking craziness going on in the world and how I've never seen a movement quite like this span not just all 50 states but it's gone global. Every country that has any sort of freedom is, oh, dude, you got the fucking Deathly Hollows going? What a coincidence. Oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> dude, what a coincidence, bro. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this go. Dude, Cheers, baby. It is on, baby, like Donkey Kong. <laughs> so I was saying that 9-11 was probably the one time in my history of living on this planet that I can remember 50 states doing something in lockstep together. Yeah, that's true. After 9-11, everyone had their flags up. Everybody was hyper-patriotic, standing arm-in-arm, arm, denouncing terrorism. And in some capacity, we're seeing that play out right before our very eyes here with uh, this police brutality movement. It's true. It's fact. I think it's long, long, long needed as well. Um, it's funny, 9-11 even brought the Democrats and the Republicans together. I remember how unified even those clowns wanted to be during that time. But it's, um, it's, it's very interesting times, um, especially since considering there's a pandemic going on. And despite that, people still brave the streets to protest. And, and I thought it was really, it's really unique and incredible to see. Um, I think going forward I, i'm hoping this means that we're just going to have less tolerance with bullshit honestly and i think this kind of sort of proved that right because look at look at the land is burning now just like it, after after another shooting which, which 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 begs to begs to reason like why why could you guys have waited like two weeks or something right like i, I know it's kind of like almost sadistic to say it that way but it's like dude, are you unaware of what's going on right now <laughs> everybody everybody's in such a hyper sensitive state in all sorts of different emotions, right? Whether they're hypersensitive yep. to, uh, you know, the health and wellness of their 
you know, fellow Americans, whether they're hypersensitive to the, you know, the hyper politicization of, you know, what's going on between the movements and people exercising their first amendment right to protest. Mm -hmm. It's, it's incredible, man. And the amount of jumping back and forth that I've seen from all the major news outlets, specifically the CNNs and the Fox news of the world, right? When you had those protesters storming Michigan's capital strapped to the teeth with bulletproof vests and AK-47, CNN was talking about how don't they understand that they shouldn't be protesting right now? You know, there's a pandemic going on. And then four days later, you see the horrific incident between George Floyd and the Minneapolis Police Department at the hands of an officer who not only had direct connection to George Floyd, by all accounts, they used to work at a, at a bar as bouncers together, but just the dynamic between cops and black people. And honestly, just the power dynamic between police officers and people in general was just yeah. the catalyst that created this massive explosion of anger and frustration. But then CNN is talking now about how we need to be able to exercise our first amendment rights. And I'm just like, dude, you can't have it both ways, man. Either you can let both sides protest or you can't. I understand that the dynamics are a little bit different. One is protesting, you know, getting haircuts because, you know, were closed because of a pandemic. And the other one is this has been happening for, you know, over a century where people are unjustly getting taken down by people in power and seemingly getting away with it, but not anymore because cell phones are out, but that's an okay protest. I'm just, my head is swimming, man. I don't, I don't quite know. <laughs> I don't quite know where I should be on this. It's true. I, you know, I, I think what's important is you're, you, you tend to have very liberal views, but at, at the same time, you could still call CNN on their bullshit. Um, Cause that's kind of where we're at, right? I, it's both sides doing the same thing. I, I would argue that CNN seems to be more logical most of the time than Fox news, but it's, it, it's sort of the same thing, right? It's, it's a contradiction if you're going to allow it one way or the other. Um, I don't think you can look at it objectively and say, Hey, well, one person's arguing for a haircut and one person's arguing for black rights. I think protesting should be allowed on both sides. I would maybe sort of highlight the fact that you have armed protests for haircuts and nobody was arrested. Yeah. Um, but then you have very peaceful protesting. Obviously, there was some looting and rioting, but a lot of the cops targeted very peaceful protests. There's a lot of people, a couple of people that lost their lives that weren't doing anything other than standing there and just trying to be part of a protest. So... I think where we need to be is kind of sort of unified on what's what's police brutality, what isn't, and what, what should be done by, uh, about the police departments going forward, um, amongst other things. So as one of, one of the people whose opinion I probably value as much or more than anybody else, as someone I consider a peer and a close friend, what, what is your opinion on the movement to abolish the police? And I, and I don't mean that in the same sense of the actual word abolish, because I think that term is being thrown around pretty cavalierly. Mm -hmm. I think most logical people are asking for police to be better trained and to perhaps not handle situations that are not inherently violent in nature, you know? Um, yeah. so, so I think perhaps the way to look at it is not abolishing, but restructuring, retraining, reallocating funds to different resources that mm -hmm. enable police to do the the difficult job of tracking down really horrible and heinous criminals, but also not putting them in a situation that's hypersensitive where they have to navigate a domestic dispute or somebody who is perhaps on substances that isn't in the right state of mind, you know, because they're not necessarily trained in those, in those capacities. So what, what is your opinion on the whole abolish the police movement as more of a means of reallocating funds and working towards better resolutions versus getting rid of them altogether? Well, for starters, uh, I mean, I think abolish is a better word than defund. A lot of people use the defund term. And the problem with that is it sets up the it sets up an incorrect precedence of what we should actually do. I think there are people and remember, there are a lot of I don't want to say uneducated, but poorly educated people who really, truly feel that defund means like no police department. It's going to be the lawless wild, wild west again. Right. Defund, I think, obviously means re reappropriate the money in different ways. Like, let's just look at the facts. The police department is it's ineffective, right? They solve very few amounts of crimes. Um, a lot of times they tend to do a lot more harm than good in a lot of way. And the problem with the police department is they are almost always, in fact, I think always the largest um, city budget uh, for, for every city. It's the largest budget on, well, on, on, on file. I don't mean to jump in, but uh, one of my really good friends, you, you know, uh, you know, my friend Zach and his wife Milda, she sent yeah. me a 
she sent me a 2018 budget, uh, fiscal budget from San Diego. And this is, you know, simply an anecdotal story about one particular police department. But the, I think depending on the size of the city, the funding is probably relatively accurate. So their fiscal budget was somewhere around $1.6 billion and mm -hmm. 450 million of that was to police enforcement. Yeah, and if you look at the LA one, it's like $3.8 billion of their city budget is their police department, but you have very, very small amounts of money that's uh, it's set aside for education, for, for teachers funds, for, for things that actually do things on, on, on a daily basis. And the problem with the police department, it's a lot of money that you have to pay to have a 24 hour surveillance, right? Um, and it, and it sort of just starts there. I think there's a lot of money we can take from those budgets and reapportion it. For example, why why is it that police officers should have to respond to like a, a noise complaint, right? Because what's going to happen when when you show up to a party and you have a bunch of drunk people, people acting belligerent and, and, and things of that nature, you're gonna have a violent episode where there doesn't need to be a violent episode, right? It's like the Wendy's situation in Atlanta last night. The guy was drunk, obviously. Um, and he stole the taser from the two dudes, the, the two police officers, right? He was able to come and do the taser and then he ran away and they shot him, right? That's probably a situation that doesn't necessarily need that much force in, in, in hand. And like you said, you take some of that money, obviously you reportion it to, to per perhaps training. Um, why can't two fully trained police officers apprehend one male? It, it's, it's, it's mind boggling, right? I mean, that's, you, you, you sort of have to, you sort of are helped with, uh, highlighting or sorry um describing your police department as pathetic if you if you can't have two men apprehend one man right so reapportion it to train re reproportion re the money and re reallocate the money towards training is obviously one 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 avenue that you can go but i think we really need to explore alternative ideas for a police force i i'm not sure that the joe biden community task force is really going to be up to this task as well i i don't know exactly what we what we need to do but obviously there needs to be changes with 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 the police with the police department um because where it is right now i think we have too many police officers too many gun gun heavy gun ready to you know ready to fire wild wild west type police officers responding to situations in which case there there absolutely needs to be no violence so and i would say to sort of piggyback on what you were just talking about with the whole wild wild west gung-ho guns drawn i'm pulling mine out before you even have a chance to respond to what I'm asking you to do. I have a few, I wouldn't say friends, but acquaintances that are involved in some capacity within the law enforcement side of things. And what they seem to see in a lot of these large metropolitan areas where they're constantly advertising for more police to join the force is you get a lot of these folks that come in with their guns already blazing, right? They have a power dynamic struggle within themselves and they need to be in a position of authority mm -hmm. and when you give when you give someone like that the keys to the car they're going to use it inappropriately right like right. you don't give a 16 year old kid a lambo because he's going to run that shit straight into the fucking wall or turn that shit upside down on a freeway you know you teach him how to drive it first you teach him how to be responsible with the power that he's got or she's got and you make sure that they know what they're getting themselves into and i think part of the problem is, and this is something you may have seen if you've watched one of the recent uh, Patriot Act reports from Hassan Minaj. He was talking about how the training of police has become militarized. And instead of learning as much, or at least within a couple orders of magnitude, more about de-escalation versus being the first one to pull, to pull their guns out, right? It's not a matter of trying to de-escalate a situation necessarily. It's about when you're doing the one, two, three, turn, draw, and shoot, it's you better turn on two and draw your guns and shoot because you need to preemptively be aware of what someone else might do. And I understand that in some situations, the decision between action and inaction is so razor thin that by not preemptively acting, someone else's life could be in danger. And as a you know, police officer, that is as much, if not more, your responsibility to protect the innocent people around you versus the person you've been called or the group you've been called into police, right? But I think we've created this dynamic and this paradigm where in in essence we look at officers as problems and not solutions. And I think that's sort of a symbiotic relationship that has unfortunately been developed between the us and them mentality. But I think in general if we 
like you said, spend more time educating and more time working on alternate resources that can work in coordination with police officers instead of having them be the first ones sent out to, like you said, a noise complaint. You know, you have some subset of the department that reaches out to them and says, hey, you need to turn down the volume or we have to send, you know, like, it's almost like firing the warning shot before mm -hmm. sending in the cavalry. To fire in the finishing shot. Ah, sorry, yeah. pun intended. Um, no, uh, I think another place where you need to start a psychological eval, like, again, essentially what you just talked about, right? Here, here, let me give you an example. If you're in the military and you're in armed combat overseas, you were taught to de-escalate a situation. You might have a mother or a child running towards you that could be strapped with a bomb and you're not allowed to just shoot that person, right? So these military folk overseas, they're able to essentially gather data and, and make these decisions to save lives overseas. There is no reason that police officers cannot do the same thing. And I'll point out something else. If you look at the, the George Floyd, uh, Derek Chauvin case, what's that? He's, he's got his knee on his neck for, for, for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Well, there, there, that dude, like there's three other police officers around. There's two behind the right. car holding his hips and his knees down. And I, I get it, right? We don't know necessarily everything that happened before that, you know, like maybe he was struggling a little bit, but dude, this guy was handcuffed and on his stomach and he wasn't going to do anything at that point. He, he, and if he could, you're, you, you really suck. If he, if, if he's he handcuffed on his knee, on his belly, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. The problem is, is that he wasn't perceived as a threat and the whole, the whole premise of almost any text you read says the sanctity of life should be held more important than any other. Right. right. And at this point you've, subdued the suspect right no matter how violent or angry he was he was effectively no threat Correct. and i understand that maybe you're not in the right state of mind when someone's shoving a camera in your face but i mean for crying out loud e even even if you want to give him the benefit of the doubt until the point where the guy goes unconscious there was still another two minutes where his knee was still on the guy's neck after he'd already gone unconscious. You really or here's another thing too when the wendy's dude is running away you're shooting him in the back. Why can't you shoot him in the legs? If you, <laughs> if you if you have a gun, if you're able to have a gun, you should be able to know how to fire it and be at least somewhat accurate with your shots. And I know cops do target practice. They do shooting, shooting ranges nonstop. But I mean, you can't tell me that somebody purposely shoots in the back of the head or the back of the neck, right? I mean, either you don't know how to fire or you're shooting there purposely. Why can't you shoot him in the leg? If you feel like you need to shoot a running a, a guy who's running, why can't you shoot him in the leg? But realistically, why, why, do you, why do you even need to go that route, right? Like, why, why is it that, why can't you just pursue, get back up, and go from there? I, I just don't understand. And police officers wear protective, obviously wear bulletproof vests and everything. You can't tell me that somebody's running away, if, even if you think it's a gun, even though we know it was the, the stolen taser, not anything else. But even if you think it's a gun, you can't pretend that somebody on the run is going to turn around and fire shots and hit you in the face from a distance. So at that point, I don't, you're only shooting a man just because you feel like killing him because you were mad that he was able to get away from two people who were supposed to be apprehending. And now you're mad because you have somebody who's not following your orders. And this comes back to my psychological eval. A lot of these people have these positions of power because they have a power. It's like the Stanford prisoner experiment. When you give people a false sense of power, they're going to abuse that sense of power, right? And this is a very, very, very interesting uh, experiment. I'm sure you know quite a bit about okay. it, right? Yeah. Um, within, like, within like four hours, they were already at each other's throats because of that dynamic. Because of the dynamic, right? And it's completely made up. It's complete bullshit, right? And so this is the situation we have the cops. Now, we're, we're trying to give the police a position of power simply because as a society, we have deemed that necessary. But at the same point, you have to have people who inherit this power without the intention of abusing this power. And we know human beings tend to abuse power. It's just, it's just normal human nature. But getting upset because someone's not listening to you and administering deadly force is not an appropriate usage of power. I'm sorry. If you, feel, if, if you get that upset because someone doesn't want to listen to you, you cannot be a police officer. And we need to have psychological evaluations that can identify this and prevent these type of people from getting jobs. But the sad part is, unfortunately, most people who are joining the police officer fall under these terms. 40% of police officers have been involved in domestic violence cases. 40%. And nobody's talking about that. This isn't some made up statistic. These are just facts. And I'm not saying they beat their wives to death, but some sort of 
domestic violence complaint has been issued against 40% of police officers. That to me seems like something we can prevent, right? Not the domestic okay. violence, but the eval that goes with it, because should be able to- I think that is probably as much of a symptom of the profession that they're in as it is the type of mentality that they have, right? Because- I don't know. I don't know if that's true because I, sure, 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 sure situations come that, but you still have to be a person who's capable of doing this, right? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not disputing that. What, I, what I'm just saying is when you're, it's the same thing when someone comes back from combat zone and they have PTSD and they overreact to certain situations, right? When you're always in a constant state of anxiety, when you're in a constant state of concern for your well-being and perhaps the community's well-being, and I'm not saying that there aren't plenty of folks out there that are just in it for, you know, the testosterone rush, right? Because there's plenty of that. But I think to your point, the psychological evaluation is something that is sorely lacking, right? Like, I don't think there's even enough resources for police to handle the type of trauma that they experience. You know, when you walk into, when you walk into a house and you see, you know, a family butchered at the hands of a, you know, of a 14 year old kid, or you see, you know, a murder suicide between a, you know, a husband and his wife and kids, it's just, that stuff lives with you. And I don't think there's the resources for them to combat that on a psychological level. So they take it home, right. And they take it out on unfortunately the wrong person, because I think in general, and of course, you know, there's plenty of statistics that will say otherwise, but I think in general, the majority of people that get into the profession do so in the same way that perhaps a fireman wants to, right. They want to help the community. They want to help make things safer. And somewhere along the line that becomes blurred and it just, the psychological trauma, takes hold and it becomes an us versus them mentality. And I think the, symbi the symbiosis between how that works between them and the community exacerbates the problem. And you start seeing things like, it, like, like it's happening with all these peaceful protests, right? Somebody throws a rock or says the wrong thing or a car backfires. And before you know it, everyone is so alert that it just becomes fucking pandemonium. That's true. I'll give you that. But at the same token, I mean, these aren't, these aren't military combat individuals. These are people who, for the most part, won't see anything, any type of stress at all. They may think they are. Um, and they may see, they, sure, you might see somebody, right? Like, that's, that's this possession you're getting into. But it's not like day in and day out, these guys are fighting crime on the streets and stuff. The majority of their day is driving around in a car doing absolutely nothing. So if you can't handle those situations and that stress and that limited amount of exposure, then quite frankly, you shouldn't have that position because there are people that go to war and come back and aren't affected by those type of things or, or go over or, or overseas and come back and can still pull themselves together in order to be able to handle it, right? And I, that's what I mean by eval is being able to determine who can't handle the absolute slightest amount of of, of emotional trauma and you know obviously some of these police officers do see a lot they do I, and I, I can't I can't disagree with that but the majority of them absolutely do not they absolutely they may even go their whole entire career without seeing one dead body in large cities and large metropolitan areas where you have a massive population of people you're inherently going to see a lot more of it and that's why you tend to you see might. it because remember, well, in, in those large metropolitan areas, there's also a lot more police officers. So the chances of you being the one to respond to anything in particular is very low. So uh, and, and even if you are seeing crime or violent crime, you're, I don't think you're seeing it enough where it's going to be anything more than watching a movie and watching 50 people die, right? Like you're going to see it in limited exposures. Maybe you're going to see some sort of, I, I, I just don't think that it's enough for where to be like, hey, let's feel sorry for these officers for what they have to go through. It's, you know what I'm saying? Is that, is, does that make sense? No, it makes total sense. But I think statistically, right, there are roughly, I mean, there's tens of millions of interactions between police officers and people on a yearly basis. And right. over the last five years, the average number of police fatalities by gunshot has, is about a thousand. So, I mean, if you extrapolate that, we're talking about the odds are one in 10,000, which is, of course, not, I mean, it should be, it should be zero, right? Like in, in the instance, unless it's absolutely, and I mean, so necessary where someone's life is literally hanging in the balance, then I totally, you know, I, I can understand the justification for it. But I think there are enough cases that this happens where folks seem to be able to skirt responsibility for it. And then you have unions that are protecting the bad eggs. It makes all the good eggs look bad, right? When you have, like, there's no teacher's union that's going to defend, a, you know, a seven, like a 14 year old kid that gets abused by their 35 year old teacher, whether it's you know, woman on male or male on female, right? There's no mm -hmm. teachers union that's going to defend that. But when you have these institutions that are protected by, you know, the shield that they wear, and you have this, this, this whole top down mentality where we have to all defend our, you know, defend each other. I mean, the, the goal shouldn't be to defend each other, it should be to defend the community, right? And as soon as you have a bad egg, you need to get that bad egg out. And I think that's sort of where 
the, the larger problem comes into play is that it's hard to have trust in an institution where the institution works so hard to defend itself that it won't necessarily take the bad eggs and put them out. It's true. It's absolutely true. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it, it's a really good point. I find it difficult to, to defend police officers for their actions simply because you can always choose not to be a police officer. And that's at the end of the day, if you can't handle it, you shouldn't be there. So when you shoot a pol- when you shoot a man running that doesn't need to be shot and killed, like you should be fully responsible for those things. And I think other people who want to jump on the bandwagon and say, "Oh, police officers, this and that," no, it's a it's a career. It's a career choice. You can go back, and it's not a career choice that even makes a lot of money, really. I mean, you get a pretty good pension from the government, but it's not like you like it's something. I and mean, for me, being a police officer never justified the means, right? At least for me. Yeah, you, I mean, I, I don't. I think I think in a lot of ways you're right, man. The do the do the ends justify the means? Uh, I don't think. Sorry, Luca. No, you, I know. Uh, we have a little bit, but you might want to. Uh, I thought a little bit. Uh, Hi, Mila. But there's some. There's some. Hi. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt the caliente <laughs> conversation. <laughs> Dude, we're spicy right now. We're spicy. <laughs> it's spicy. It's spicy. Uh, there's a little bit of mock pie like this much, so it okay. would be enough for the next meeting, I would imagine. Okay. You're on a break or something. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. You can come over anytime. I can feed while I take the class. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Multitasking. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> She's taking a class on data analysis, uh, just like a refresher course, basically. So, nice. uh, yeah. She was making sure we have milk for when the baby wakes up. I'm just bored. <laughs> yeah. I are, think, are you actually on a break or are you just walking around? Oh, yeah, I am. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think, kind of in, in summation, I think on most of these. Leave that open, babe. On most of these points, I think we kind of fall within the same. I mean, within like a standard deviation, we're pretty much on the same page, right? Yeah. We know that there are some instances where, you know, a police officer is, inc- is, inc- is an incredibly useful force, right? Because a standard civilian just having a gun in their hand trying to defend oh, themselves sure. could lead to catastrophe, right? If you get rid of police entirely and you just have everyone strapped <laughs> individually like it was oh, in the okay. 1800s, <laughs> as soon as someone comes on your property, you're just going to shoot him. Like that doesn't seem like a recipe for success. That seems like catastrophe. But I also think, to your point, there needs to be more training, right? Like perhaps instead of militarized training, you get, you know, you get like a thousand hours of martial arts training. You learn how to do jujitsu, you learn how to do body holds. So instead of, you know, stepping on someone's neck, you know how to subdue them in another way. And if you learn those techniques properly, you can be, you know, 40, 50 pounds lighter than your adversary and still get them in. Like you, you could snap an ankle, you could break a knee, you, you know, instead of killing oh, somebody. Yeah. You know, or just and, learn how to hold somebody where you don't even have to break a limb, where you can just yeah. act. You can take the five people that you have and properly subdue one person yeah. without hurting them. Like that's yeah. sort of how it is, yeah. right? Because once you hurt somebody, it then becomes cruel and unusual punishment for what that person did. It doesn't matter. According to our laws, you know, that's cruel and unusual punishment. If you go to jail, you don't get a beating every day, right? So if you harm, it's, 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 it's not legal to administer force on an individual, realistically. That's I mean, now we're gonna to have to deviate from that simply because sometimes you need to apply force That's to- been, What I think the uh, distinction is, is when they've been subdued, right? Like if they're in handcuffs, you know, if they're on the ground, there's no reason for extra punishment, right? They've already been subdued. So I think, I think we're, we're right on the, same, on the same target there. And I think your point about psychological evaluation, there needs to be more training in how to deescalate situations or to have a different part of the you know, of the police force that is instead of taught how to, you know, attack and subdue suspects, they're taught how to talk them down off the ledge, you know, police officers need to be more, they need, they need to be every, every six months or or a year, they need to go through a full psychological evaluation because any crack in that armor, any crack in that mentality can lead to horrendous catastrophic events. And sort of as a, as a good segue of, crazy shit going on. Have you seen what's going on with these autonomous zones in and around the United States? Yeah. yeah. So I'm not, I don't know too, too much about it, but I know there's one in Seattle that's supposedly run by Antifa and a lot of conservatives are losing their shit about this. Um, Interestingly enough, this whole idea of Antifa being behind these looting and anarcho opportunist chaos causing events, I think is a total, it, it, it's a misguided moniker, right? Because Antifa yeah. is just an ideology that means anti-fascism i think these folks that are donning all black and and smashing mom and pop businesses and taking shit are not antifa i think they're just anarcho-opportunists looking to hijack a protest as a means to break shit and steal stuff 
Sure. I don't, I don't think they're part of the protest. I don't even think they're really Antifa. I think they're just, they're just looking for chaos. But yes. specifically what I've, what I've heard about these uh, autonomous zones is in Seattle, they've taken a five block radius around the Capitol Hill um, and they call it CHAZ, the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. And what they've done is they've basically gotten rid of government officials and the police in that area. And immediately the first thing that you heard on Fox News three days ago, without any actual judicious <laughs> journalism or reporting, they, the first thing they said was, we heard a rumor that these Antifa folks that own this autonomous zone in Seattle are robbing and extorting small businesses for money and protection, right? Basically making it sound like fucking, yeah. making it sound like Al Capone just came back from the dead and has now taken over Seattle, <laughs> right? Immediately the next day, not only did the police chief of Seattle say that's not true, but there have been at least half a dozen small businesses that went on record to say this is the, this is the most safe we've ever felt in our lives. We've taken down the boards off our windows. You know, we're not worried about riots breaking shit because there's mm -hmm. no animus between law enforcement and individuals. And here we are two days, three days after Fox ran with this story like, you know, like a chicken with its head cut off and you still haven't, they still haven't offered a retraction for effectively yeah. instigating a conflict that didn't exist. I mean, perhaps at first it seemed like shit was going to hit the fan, but by accounts that I've read through the Seattle, like the, the small independent Seattle newspaper that's up there, USA Today, Business Week. I mean, we're talking at least a handful, if not more of, you know, reputable or, you, you know what I mean? these sources that, you know, you can actually trust more than you could trust an institution like Fox News telling you exactly the opposite of what they're trying to feed. We know what Fox News is good for. I, you know, I don't like to talk shit about that side of the political spectrum, but these followers tend to not really care about actually diving down and getting information. They like to listen to what Fox, this is the easiest, the most easiest manipulative group that exists in America because they are I mean, very passionate for for who they are and, and whatever her heritage that they claim that they have but it's obviously deep-rooted racism that's that's involved here and yeah. it's very very it's very easy to pull the strings of emotional individuals who don't actually year, want to get educated five-year heritage of the confederacy which literally only existed for the five years during the civil war <laughs> yeah except yeah and by existed you mean not recognized by anything other than itself um except for when british the british and the french momentarily um, contemplated joining the Civil War down in 1863. This is an area of my expertise, actually. Um, obviously, I'm a historian, but yeah, it's I, I, it's a group of people who are, are more motivated by emotions as opposed to actual fact getting. So Fox News does a, a brilliant job, in my opinion, in, in 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 the way that they pass their information. And by that, I mean just by not giving a fuck and saying whatever they want. I mean, they can come on radar tomorrow and say Obama. Obama murdered somebody and their their followers would absolutely eat that shit up and believe it and post shit about it without even checking to see if it's even remotely true. Um, so for that knows, I think Fox does a tremendous job <laughs> in what they're doing. Um, they'd be the only compliment I'd ever give Fox news for that, for that. But as far as the, what I would say for the Chaz zone then specifically, I mean, I, you know, the one, the one, I guess, area of caution that I would stress is this is now, right? And this is going to work for a few months, a few weeks, but inevitably people are the same and somebody's going to want more power and that's how it goes. And if you're actually pulling out um, law restrictions or any type of regulation border there, it's going to be inevitable. Sorry, my baby's waking up. It's going to be inevitable before, let me just adjust her, her, she has a moving bed. It's called a, it's called a snoo. So I can adjust that back to swaddle her. Let me see if she falls back asleep. Um, wait, wait, inevitably, wait, wait, wait. inevitably on, the system on. will break. What was that? Hold on. You, you can rock your baby to sleep from your phone? Yeah. So we have this thing called a snoo. Um, so the Scandin Scandinavians are amazing, especially when it comes to child care. they are. And Dude, I guess of this course they are. They have great health care. Everyone's <laughs> fucking happy. And you're only working 30 hours a week. This is what happens when you take care of your people. They invent better shit. So they have this bed that basically- A rising basically... tide lifts all boats, man. If you bring up everyone from ground zero to like a median level, everyone's going to be happy. This whole idea Every... that like everyone's equal now is ridiculous because they're not. We're talking about 50 years ago was the first woman who integrated into an elementary school. And people are talking about fucking civil rights like it was in the fucking 1700s. This shit was literally, like my grandparents are older than this. This mm -hmm. is fucking insanity. People Just like 40 years ago, the interracial marriage law was finally retracted. Like, are you kidding? Are, yeah, it's, 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 it's unrealistic. 
we are so far behind the rest of the world in terms of just like racial equality, sex, sex, uh, the gender equality, uh, LGBT equality. Like it's, it, it's unreal. It almost makes you think like, how are we even a, a, a first world country? How are we a leading power? Even, beyond that, I mean, even if you want to take, you know, the race and gender stuff out of it, the way that the government quote unquote takes care of its people is so draconian when you compare it to every other first world country that it's almost mind boggling, yeah. right? Like imagine how different the world would be. Imagine how different urban communities would be. Imagine how different every community would be is if nobody was worrying about struggling to get, you know, to get help when they have to go see a doctor. If they can go to a school that has textbooks that aren't 20 fucking years old, if they have facilities that are actually useful, if they can get food and fed, I mean, basic needs we're not talking about giving everyone a fucking mansion on the upper east side of new york you right. know we're not we're not we're not talking about giving everyone a fucking 10-story house in atherton i'm talking about giving everyone the basic subsistence that you need to just feel like a human and when you don't yeah. feel like a human you're going to act like an animal it's it's sort of the you know the, the prison paradox right you take someone who's human you put them in prison they come out like a fucking animal because they're treated like one they're treated you like know? One. instead of being rehabilitated they're fighting for their life literally every fucking day and if you put people in cages that's what's going to happen and whether you want to call it an actual cage or a you know a metaphorical cage you know if you're living in a community where it's desolate and everything that surrounds you is breaking down you know the community itself is breaking down how do you expect to make it out how do you survive that situation i mean the numbers of people that are able to escape those communities is such a tiny number that they almost have to be heralded as superhuman because to overcome all of those trials and those tribulations is no Hercule is, is no it's nothing short of a Herculean feat. It's a fact, dude. It's a fact. And this is what systemic racism is that the other side tries to claim doesn't exist. Oh, everybody's got an opportunity. Everybody's got an opportunity. Sure, everybody does have an opportunity. It's just that a lot of people's opportunities a lot better than most, right? Because if you grow up in the hood, you're gonna go to schools your entire life that are overcrowded you have the worst possible teachers right because they're the ones that are taking the shittiest jobs they're overworked they're underpaid you're in positions where there's fights and violence going on all around you you go home to people around you doing these things gang violence everything else right selling drugs and that's the only lifestyle that you can and if you want to make anything of yourself you better go out and join a gang or you better go out and sell drugs to make money and that's the problem is people are stuck in this situation. They don't have access to education. They don't have somebody telling them that there's actually, they literally don't have somebody saying, hey, if you go to school, you can come out with the job that's gonna pay you a shit ton of money. They don't have that. And even, and even if they do go to school, man, I mean, this is, when people talk about redistricting, you know, when it comes to politics, my first thought is not politics. My first thought is the districting, the district that they create for public schools, right? Yeah. Because roughly 9% of federal, like of, of the budgets that pu public schools get comes from federal funding. That means the other roughly 90% come from the communities. So if you live in a community, you know, that is in Watts, for instance, you know, and I, and I, and I hate to use a common, you know, a, you know, a common name that people want to use when they talk about desolate areas. But when you, when you think about an area like that, or you think about Oakland, or you think about East Palo Alto in the nineties, when you draw a district in that area, roughly 30 to 40% of that funding for that school comes from property taxes, right? And when you live in an area where property taxes are next to nothing because the property is not worth shit, you can go to a public school in, you know, East Palo Alto compared to a public school in Redwood City. And the type of instruction that you're going to get, the type of resources that you have is so vastly different. I mean, it'd be like comparing getting a school, like an education, you know, at Kenyatta College versus Stanford. Absolutely. And, you know, growing up in a kitchen with access to computers or graphing calculators, textbooks that aren't in shambles. Um, and again, a teacher who's happy to be there and is getting well, well paid. Um, so obviously, and we know, the, it, it, again, at the end of the day, teachers are just employees. And we know that if you treat your employees better, they're going to perform better. There's a direct correlation, it's causation. You treat your employees better, they're going to perform better. So if you have better teachers, you're going to offer a better education. This is non-existent in, in, in yeah. places with poor, poor, poor in poor areas. I mean, in, in some incredibly small anecdotal stories, you might find a community where more investment in teachers has not led to a direct correlation to improved wellness. But sure. I mean, we're, some we're people also about, get shot in the head and don't die, right? Yeah, I mean, so we're talking about outlaw, we right? Like <laughs> these, are, these are exceptions to the rule. If you bring up a community through education, through safety, through public services, you're going to see almost immediately the benefits. Absolutely. immediately because kids are not going to feel like they have to join 
you know, some, you know, a gang or an institution that keeps them down sort of by second hand, but it's the only way that they see to make money for their family and to make ends meet. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you lift them up from the bottom and say, look, we know that these things are problems and we're going to put more time and money into making sure you get the education that you need and to get the resources that you need just to feel like a fucking human, you're going to see almost immediate results and in a positive way. It seems so simplistic, but that's what it is. That's literally what it is. And what it takes is a lot of reproportioning of, of a money. Rising, a rising tide lifts all boats. But if one of those boats has a fucking hole in it, you better patch it up or it's going to sink. <laughs> like, sink right. That's Black Lives Matter in a nutshell. That's anything in a nutshell, really. Right. Like you say, like saying save the whales doesn't mean fuck the fish. It just means let's all save. Like we need to focus on the whales right now. Right. Well, and like and, and here's and, and here's another thing. A lot of the evangelical types somehow are staying silent on this issue about, well, you know, black lives matter, but all lives matter. Of course, all lives matter. But there's a proverb. I think it's Luke 15. And the parable goes something like he has 100 sheep. One of the sheep wanders away. And he leaves the other 99 sheep to go find the one sheep, not because he cares less about the other 99 sheep, but because the one sheep is the one that's in trouble. So you yeah. help that one sheep. Right, it's right, not, right. It's not a matter of telling the other 99, go fuck yourselves, fend for yourself. It's a matter of, look, this is the one that's in trouble. The other 99 are fine. They're still in the pen. They're being taken care of, being fed. They're being cleaned up. They're being washed, whatever. But the one sheep is walking towards a cliff and it doesn't know it yet, right? So mm -hmm. that's the sheep you got to take care of. And this idea that, you know, all lives matter, of course, all lives matter. You know, this whole thing that blue lives don't matter, of course they matter. Every fucking life is valuable. Every life has an inherent value. But if one seems to be disproportionately affected, that's the one you have to focus on. Yeah. And I think this is a really hard pill for, for you know, I don't use the term, but like, you know, white privileged individuals, I, it's a really hard pill for them to swallow. And I think the reason why is because their entire lives, they've heard people talk about, oh, we got to do more for the black community. We have to do more for the Asian community. Community. We have to do more for the LGBT community, all, all these different communities. And I think over time, and this is probably why Trump got elected, over time they feel left out because they don't realize that there was nothing that needed to be done to their communities to begin with. So they feel like everybody's doing all of these things for everybody else, but nobody's helping poor old me. Well, the fact the, is you're the, already the, standing on a podium this tall. Everybody else is down here. We're trying to make these people get up here. It's not like we forgot about you. We don't care about you. The system has already done everything for you. You just don't realize it because that didn't happen in your lifetime. It's a false sense of favoritism, right? Absolutely. They, they see these movements as other people being favorited over them. But here's the thing, right? Like you said, I don't think your analogy is perfect. If you're standing way the fuck up here, right? And everyone down here is getting help. You somehow have this fucking bastardized view where actually you're down here and they're up here. Right. But in reality, that's not how it works. What you're trying to do is bring everyone to a level playing field. And, it, and it's like Dave Chappelle said, man. We're not even trying to get equal rights. We're just trying to get civil rights, Dan. <laughs> we're trying to get civil rights. And we're not even trying to like surpass you. It's not like we forgot about you or anything like that. It's, and, and, and my point is, like, I, don't, I don't call these people necessarily racists, right? It's not like they don't want to see everybody else equal. It's just you're being incredibly selfish because you think everything revolves around you all the way up here, right? And, and that's, I think that's what irks me. And these people don't understand that they're coming off as racist right? Because they're like, I don't hate black people. I don't hate Asians. I don't hate Italians. I don't hate anybody. Right. But at the same time, you're failing to see that these other individuals actually need some help and support. And you're more focused on the fact that you can't get a haircut, Karen. And that's, I think, that's, that's, I that's think really... people don't want to, people see these movements as inherent attacks against themselves. Absolutely. And, and I think if everyone just adopted this mentality that your neighbor on your left, your neighbor on your right, and your neighbor across the street should all be afforded the same basic liberties and freedoms and help as you do, then I think it's a lot easier for them to understand where it's coming from. But, you know, like you said, man, when you're indoctrinated into a particular way of thinking and a particular way of life, and you keep watching stuff that reaffirms sure. those thoughts, you're going to have a very fucked up view on what's actually happening, right? Like you're going to see these, you're going to see these movements as, oh my God, like, look at them burning these, these buildings down. Look at them doing this and doing that. Like, how, how can that happen? And I'm like, I mean, what the fuck was America founded on? Like, do you remember the Boston Tea Party? And like, I understand that perhaps New England wasn't being burned to the ground, but the idea is the same. You're attacking the institution of your oppressor, right? The oppressor was- Thomas, the Thomas Jefferson signed the fucking Declaration of Independence. His signature's right there. He helped put the thing together. It says right there, if the government is unjust, burn that bitch to the ground i'm paraphrasing just a little bit but he says a burn and attack the country if it's not serving its people it is literally on the blueprint of this country 
right? But there's a famous saying that says, if it's a protest, a protest can never be right. You will never protest the right way, right? Because in theory, if you're protesting, your, your people up at the top, if, if there was a white right, right of protest, there would be no reason to protest, right? Because the system would be fair. So you wouldn't have to stand outside and pick a signs of peacefulness and bullshit. These riots over the last week, like you said, is the first thing you said in this conversation. It's done more for the black movement than four or 500 years of standing around trying to be peaceful about this situation, right? I mean, there's legislation all over the country that's changing as we speak in terms of this. This is, this is proper protesting. And, and like I said, you talk about, you know, oh, there's a peaceful way to protest. There's a peaceful way to protest. There's certain individuals who, like I said, if you, if you continue to stay peaceful, nothing will change. Nothing has changed. Nothing will change. And I will right? say that, like, on that same token, I do personally the idea of destroying small businesses is not being done by the protesters. No, you know? I know for a fact. And I, think, yeah. and I think the intentional obfuscation between right-wing super conservative pundits and that, that narrative is inherently further making and castigating these protests as inherently un-American. It's just a deflection tactic. That's all it is, is to, to go out and do damage and deflect the talk. It's like anybody who says MLK didn't peace or MLK didn't find the need to, to burn down buildings. Yeah, but MLK was assassinated, bro. Like, what, what, what you know, it, it's just a deflection tactic instead of, or people who are all like, you know, a lot of people got angry about the protests and the violence and the riot, but they weren't angry about George Floyd getting getting murdered, right? It's again, it's a deflection tactic. You want to take away from the real issue by saying, hey, look, or like when Colin Kaepernick needs for the flag, oh, he's being disrespectful for the troops. But when well, Drew whether or not, whether or not he is being disrespectful, whether, hold on, whether or not he's being disrespectful is, is, is entirely your opinion. I don't care what you think. Or I don't care what anybody thinks, right? But the moment is the fact that you're starting to pay more attention about that instead of what he's actually protesting is a deflection tactic, right? Exactly. And you can see that firsthand when you see these fucks like Laura Ingram say <laughs> four years ago, he should just shut up and play. LeBron yeah, should LeBron shut up James, and, shut up and dribble. LeBron, 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 shut LeBron, up and dribble. Should, yeah, which should just shut up and dribble. But then when, you know, the left wing, and, and, and again, this is how these two play this fucking seesaw game because they're both basically two sides of the same bullshit coin, it seems like in some instances. Then you see Drew Brees coming out and saying, well, you know, I would never disrespect the flag. And then Laura Ingram's like, we shouldn't get on his case. He's, you know, free speech. He's creating his opinion. Like, dude, hmm, yeah. I wonder. I, I wonder why this is okay, but this, this other form of protesting, Colin Kaepernick taking a knee, which had nothing to do with the troops. This whole idea of being un-American. No, dude, protesting and taking a knee is exactly American. That's about as American as it can be. Like, literally, the first fucking amendment in the Bill of Rights is to protest your government in some capacity when you see well, something. The first thing we did as, like, an organization was protest, right? <laughs> We're like, hey, King George III, we don't really like you. So we're going to like protest you. And yeah, we're going to throw some tea over the side of the fucking ship and, 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 fire and whatever. And, and do a bunch of other things, right? That's a protest, bro. And like, if you don't like protest, then you have to admit that you'd rather be an English colony. You have to. Either that or you're just a fucking idiot racist. And most people would prefer not to be called idiot racist. So I guess sign us back up. Like, should we call England? Can we make that happen? Like, I'll send an email tomorrow and see if uh, see if the Queen's down to just. Well, I mean, engage. look the way the way the way the way they protect their own, like Prince Andrew and the Duke who used to be married to uh, uh what what's her name, Princess Diana. I mean, you uh, know, maybe it's, maybe maybe it's not so bad. Maybe we should just have the, they should just take us back. We're the you know the redheaded stepchild that was kicked out, and now we want to come back home. Now we want to come back. We ran away from home, <laughs> home a long time ago, and we're like, we're, <laughs> we made a mistake. Like we come back during our like thirties. We're like, hey, you know, about that. Like, can we can we come home? Can you can you have us a room to rent? Jeez. Speaking of rooms to rent, my wife and I are considering moving to New Zealand eventually, just because, dude, just, just as an alternative. Uh, Oh, you mean, I mean, you mean the I don't, I, I don't want to be one of those far cry individuals who are like, oh, America's crashing and burning and this sucks and blah, blah, blah. We're still one of the best countries out there, period. And there's still a lot we have to learn and a lot to change. And I love my country. But if we can't live in a place as universal health care, like, can you imagine like getting coronavirus and having to pay a million dollars for treatment? Like, is that even a fucking thing? Like, are you kidding versus, me? Versus living in a country that's like, we're just going to shut shit down. We're going to pay all of our businesses to keep their doors open so that people don't go on unemployment. And we're also going to make sure that you're going to get the health care you need. Oh, and then we're going to also be the first country to fully reopen because we had no fucking cases because we listened to fucking medical experts. 
And I guess, I guess it's easy to do when you're a 5 million, 5 million resident country that's an island of itself. I get it. But at the same time, bro, like South Korea did the same thing. They sent all of their people gift boxes. They even had a bottle of whiskey in it, might I add. They had to give everybody a bottle of fucking whiskey amongst all things. They were right next to China. And they started their corona pandemic at almost identical times in the United States. And they killed and murdered that shit. Like, it was... I think they had the first reported case on the exact same day. And they started testing yeah. like 10,000 people a day. And we couldn't even test that many in a fucking week when this first happened. It's, it's, it's embarrassing, dude. It, we, still, we, still can't even, we still can't even do testing. It's, it, it's unreal. I don't know. I, I, but you know what? I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not even sure who's to blame about the testing. Because to me, it seems like that's more of a liberal idea that we can't get testing done. Because if we did this right because the liberals want to, to to have coronavirus be the largest panic of all time and i get it right it's it, this is obviously serious and you know how, how serious my wife and i take this um but it seems to to shoot more for the liberals as far as like a political agenda to make the, the oh, coronavirus yeah. continue to fail because it makes but, trump look worse and worse right the, the the liberals and the left totally fucked up everything when it had to do with trying to get trump out of office first of all they ran a shit campaign with hillary clinton then they tried this whole russian probe which I mean, anybody with a fucking brain knew that it wasn't going to go anywhere, no matter how much evidence you presented the Senate, because they have the fucking majority. Yep. Like, all this shit. And this is just their last, this is the last gasp of a dying fucking, of a dying group, you know? They're trying so hard to get him out of office, but they will literally, you know, hyper-politicize everything just to get him out of office. And I think this is unfortunately where it's going to lead us, and I don't see a Democratic victory in November. I don't see a Democratic victory either. And the reason why is because I, I just don't, I don't, I don't think... <laughs> Joe Biden is the best that you can do, man. Like, come on, come on. Bro. Yeah, I mean, like, not the representation that the Democratic Party can't even get it right because he's not the representation that anybody wanted, first and foremost. And this is the second election in a row where the representation that I think the majority of the people wanted is not going to be the person that's on on, on the ticket. Democratic Republic, and I'm not saying we're all anti-socialists, but what it is is DNC doesn't believe Bernie has a real shot of beating Donald Trump. But the truth is, sending out another generic old white guy who has basically has dementia is not the solution. This guy's been in politics for his entire life. And in most places, he's done nothing. And not only that, but he's also spewed bullshit, racism, everything that you could possibly not want your Democratic uh, Party candidate to stand for. He's done that. You could find it somewhere. I, in what history. I would have loved to see, and we'll never get it in our lifetime, because by the time it's possible, he'll probably be dead. Shout, out to, my, shout out to my boy, Bernie. But dude, I wanted Bernie dude, too, but at the same time, I don't know that I actually wanted him to win the election because I don't know if we're ready for Bernie Sanders. I don't know if we could have got behind it because ticket, the other side will fight anything, right? Social my dream ticket, dude, would have been him and fucking Andrew Yang because Andrew yeah, dude, Yang, I'm part of the Yang gang for sure. Dude, Yang fucking gang. Yang gang is like basically Bernie 2.0. So we have at least another 50 years of potentially electing Andrew Yang. So there's, there is some good news in that regard. But yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm a full supporter of Andrew Yang going, going forward. And you know what? And it's not even because I agree with all of his polic like policies, right? All the things that he wants to do. I don't even know if I'm necessarily an ardent supporter of everything. But he, to me, comes across as an earnest individual who wants to try and do the best for everybody. Right. You know? And if you have a ticket that is diverse enough to have the son of immigrants and an old white guy who's basically a fucking socialist, which I think was the, whole, was the worst way he could have ran his campaign for the Democratic National nomination right if he'd have just said something like compassionate capitalism that would have gone a lot further than to call himself a socialist because people for some reason have this idea that socialism equals communism which it's not but you know you can't convince those people otherwise it's no, you can't because people are uneducated it's unfortunate if you hear here let me I'll, I'll explain to anybody who happens to watch this video if you want to put communism as your scale of one and capitalism is five on a scale of one to five Socialism can be found right in the middle at three, not closer to communism, not closer to capitalism. It's like the leeway between the two, right? Yeah. Exactly. And, and people just don't understand that. And there's good reason for this. During the Red Scare in the 50s, obviously, during the McCarthy era, people wanted, people were absolutely scared of communism and for very good reason, right? I mean, me personally, communism is probably the best form of government, ideally. But it would take for people to understand that no one's better than anybody else. And that actually share and work for the common good of human human civilization, which will never happen. And this that's, is why communism that is the continues. inherent conundrum of of the whole power paradigm, right? Like right, right, right. And this, will, this and this right. will never happen. And this is why communism will never work, and it, it cannot work because of human nature. But in, ideally, it's the best. But socialism shares a lot of fundamental similarities between communism that I think can be useful in capitalism. If you look at like we talked about the Scandinavian I think, country. I think with the right combination of forward thinking individuals and not this idea of legacy politics, you can <laughs> take you can take ideas from all sorts of different 
aspects of forms of government, right? Like even to a certain degree, like in, in some instances, like in extreme wartime, having someone who's a little bit more authoritarian might actually be useful in times of, you know, strife among people who are poor and impoverished and being hurt. Some form of socialism is useful in an era where certain communities, certain schools are not being granted the same sort of funds just because of the property value in that area. Some form of communism and redistribution of wealth can be useful. This mm -hmm. idea that we have to live in a fucking binary world where it's either this or it's that and not some quantum state of the two of them is fucking ridiculous. Well, it's also a complete joke and a complete lie. So every time a government gets, I mean, sorry, every time a business gets bailed out by the government, that's socialism. Socialism. And yep. we already accept that, right? We also accept the fact that socialism is what saved us from the Great Depression, right? It's the New Deal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal and all his social plans. We forget about that. Things like social security, for example, social security, right? But people don't understand that socialism is already there. And that's, I, I think that's what we, we, we just don't understand what this form of government or what I'm sorry, what this form of economy actually is. And that's, and that's what, you know, that's what the problem is. And as long as you have rich people at the top that are going to continue to brainwash stupid people into thinking that socialism is the idea because they're the only ones that have anything to lose, right? You talk about big pharma losing money because of socialized healthcare, for example. It, you know, I think what boggles my mind the most is like you can't, you want to sit and people want to sit and listen to these guys like they have nothing to lose, right? Like, oh my God, you're right. This wouldn't cost these people millions of dollars. They're telling us that socialism won't work because it really truly won't work. And you're not looking at it like, wait a minute, it's going to cost them billions of dollars. You don't think there's a reason they're telling you that socialism can't work or certain social policies can't work. You don't think it's that money that's coming out of their paychecks. You don't, you don't think that has anything to do. You honestly think that these people care about you? Really? I don't know. Like, how can you be so naive? How can people be so naive? But again, we go back all the way to that whole education argument that we talked about. And this is why we're not teaching these things properly in schools to start with. So people grow up with this complete falsehood about what, what works and what doesn't. And it's embarrassing because if you look across the pond, if you look at basically in any first world country, you know that there's socialism stamped all over it. But if you look across the pond to the Scandinavian countries who, like you said, 32 hour work weeks, give everybody money, get a year off of uh, maternity leave. Even fathers get four months of paternity leave. Off. Some of them get as much as six or eight months even, yeah. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's incredible. You understand that these things actually do work, but what are we going to do? And that's, that's why I think that Bernie Sanders, as great as he would have been, it, or could have been, I'm sorry, great as he could have been, he, he wouldn't have worked because us. the other side would just keep fighting it. I think in some ways he was just, he was just too good for us. He came at the wrong time. Yeah, in another 50 years, Bernie Sanders is probably, you know, but what, what can you do? And that's a perfect, I think the the last you know minute long soliloquy you just went on was a perfect summation of all the different issues that we've covered and mm -hmm. bro i appreciate you coming on <laughs> i know that and dude you got a little a little one at home that i still haven't met in person maybe i'll fucking have to do a drive i'll have to do a drive by one of these days so i can wave i'll do it <laughs> you guys can do a fucking royal wave as i drive <laughs> i can do the yeah the, the, the turn the hand right you gotta put your you gotta put your other hand here too like here we come, Miss America. Yeah, exactly. All robotic. Thanks. Bro, thank you, man. I love you. I love your family. You guys stay well. And we'll Anytime. We still have to we still have to debate the goat goat argument here. So I was excited about that. So Dude, next time. Go, we're gonna go, go, goat, man, because I think we both have to come to the fucking realization that Joker's gonna take it all, dude. Uh, not if the coronavirus continues to wipe out Grand Slam Please. after Grand Slam. <laughs> one time, I'm rooting for the corona, dude, just for another year or two so that he gets into his mid-30s and Dominic Team and all these young guys can really come into their own. That's what I was about to say. I was literally about to say Dominic Team can be coming back because of this corona. Oh, Let's go. Oh, only hope, man. Oh, God. All right. Brother, peace out. I love right. you and love be you well. We'll talk to you soon, okay?